الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صراة والسنة من دائمين بدوام منك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وشهد أنه الله الذي لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله واحدا ورب شاهدا ونحن له مسلمون وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيوننا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على دين كله ولو كره المشركون أما بعد يا إبال الله إني مسيكم ونفس إياي بتقوى الله الحمد لله We thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for the blessing of this deen for the blessing of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam for the blessing of the Quran for the blessing of the Sunnah for all of the great blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and how Allah tabarak wa ta'ala for the believer in every time and in every circumstance has given him a makhraj that is a way out and on this blessed day of Jumu'ah we want to remind ourselves is that the Quran, Al Karim, and the Sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give us guidance in every single state. In all circumstances, we find in it the guidance that we need to navigate the terrain. And in one of the blessed hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that we find that he was asked by Sayyidina Abdi bin Abi Talib. And when he came out and he was hearing people talk about the current affairs for that particular time, what is going on? And when Sayyidina Ali heard them, that he remembered something that the Prophet himself had told him. And he responded to these individuals who were talking about what was happening around them. And he said that, إِنِّي قَدْ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ Indeed that I have heard the Messenger of Allah صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ say أَلَا إِنَّهَا سَتَكُونُ فِتْنَةً Indeed there will be fitna. There will be trials and tribulations and civil strife and indiscriminate killing and all different types of calamities and oppression in the whole range of meanings that is included by this word fitna. And then look at the sagacity of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. As that he said, Mal makhraj minha ya Rasulullah. What then is the way out of this fitna, O Messenger of Allah? And then our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as that he said, Kitabullah. He said, Kitabullah. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he goes on to describe the various characteristics and traits and special nature of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is how he began. This is what he wanted to teach the ummah. Is that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way out. This is the way out of any circumstance that we find ourselves in when we need guidance. When we need to know what to do. But then this opens up the question for you and I, given this reality, and indeed the Prophet Sallallahu that he only speaks truth. When he says that the Qur'an is the way out, what that means is you and I need to have a connection to his book. We need to have a connection in his book, to his book, not only in terms of being able to read it, but also pondering its meanings and spending an extended period of time thinking about how those meanings that we are reading pertain to our particular lives in particular circumstances. And then in the process, we might read a story and understand something from it, and then we have to ask, we have to be associated with people of knowledge. Is this understanding correct, this principle, this archetype that is being mentioned here, when I apply that to my life in particular, Am I getting it right? And if we pause here and think 
about how the companions themselves used to read the book of Allah. It's very telling. And sometimes here we start to realize our shortcomings. Is that just reading the book of Allah and being able to read is not enough. Just being able to recite the book of Allah beautifully is not enough. Of course, that is important. And there's something special that when you have someone that has a beautiful voice with beautiful recitation, that the impact of that recitation is greater upon your heart. Indeed. However, that is not where we stop. And we tend to stop there as a community. Where it's just about being able to read. It's just about being able to recite. And usually one of the main criterion by which we choose the imam is how beautiful is his recitation. This is, of course, one of the criterion. However, is that we first and foremost need to also look at people that are living the book of Allah, that are walking examples in an imperfect sense, but to some degree to the way that our Prophet ﷺ was doing this. He was the walking example of what it means to put the book of Allah into practice. This needs to be reflected in our teachers, in our imams, the people that we are learning this religion from, and is that they need to assist us in coming to understand its meaning as well. And this is perhaps one of the greatest fruits of what it means to connect to Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the true people of this religion that through their unbroken chains of transmission back to the Prophet Wasallam are living the realities of the deen in the way that they were intended to be lived. And so the companions, when they themselves used to read Allah's book, their number one intention was amal. It was to put the knowledge of the Qur'an into practice. And so you and I, if this is our number one intention, that presupposes that we know how to read, that presupposes we know how to recite, that presupposes is that we have an ability to access its meanings. And you and I need to get those skills, but not limit ourselves to them. And if we fall short in them, surround ourselves with people who can then clarify the meanings of the book to us. This is the greatest way we could spend our time. But when you look at the book of Allah through this lens, i.e., the lens of putting it into practice, you will have amazing meanings that open up to your heart. From very early on in the book of Allah, Tabarakatari, beginning with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And all the way through the various means of the Fatiha. And we've recited the Fatiha so many times, it should be very easy for us to learn how to put the book of Allah into practice. When we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, but when we, one point of clarification, sometimes what we, when we say putting the book of Allah into practice, it doesn't always mean something outwardly. Rather, it could be a moment of experiencing what it means to be a person of faith. The first verse of the Quran is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the all-merciful, the compassionate. And that ba in the Bismillah has many meanings. One of them, as the scholars tell us, is isti'ana. In other words, is that I am seeking the assistance of Allah. Allah, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then the belief that we have in Allah being the Rahman and Rahim. If you think of the Bismillah in this way, and then you then think about what it means to evoke the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, and you put the Quran into practice that way, and for those moments that you think about the implications of Allah being Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, and how that manifests in His creation you will start to open up the door to an incredible vast valley upon valley of meanings that will then that come into your heart. And then it's very easy to understand as well when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You are putting that into practice by in that moment, recognizing that Allah sees you and having pure praise and gratitude and thankfulness come from your heart. When you praise the Lord of the worlds, Bringing to mind the magnitude of Allah's creation, 
and he brought it all into existence and he is sustaining it subhanahu wa ta'ala and it goes on till the end but then we begin surah al-baqarah alif lam mim someone might say well how can i put alif lam mim into practice what does that mean to read that with the intention of amal one of the wisdoms that they say is that these are letters that all of the arab know these are familiar letters in the arabic language however we don't know their exact meaning, only Allah knows. So, when we recite Alif Lam Mim, what do we do? Humility. Is that Allah has stated something that you and I don't know, and this is precisely so that we approach His book with humility. And so when we say Alif Lam Mim, humility comes into the heart. And then we say, ذَلِكَ kitab, Translated as, this is the book, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه, in which there is no doubt. ذلك الكتاب, the Lamb is forbid. Here, rhetorically, this is pointing to the grandeur and the greatness of Allah's book. So we come with utter humility, and then we magnify the book of Allah in our heart. ذلك الكتاب, this is the book of Allah, and we have absolutely no doubt in relation to it. In verse by verse, Word by word, when you read with this intention of putting it in the Quran into practice, you will have wonders of meaning that open up to you. And for those that have been tried to be in the public eye and to prepare lessons and to prepare talks and to prepare khutbahs and things of this nature, is that it's very easy to start going through the motions. But what we need to remind ourselves of is even as you're preparing, the number one intention is for amal. Even the person speaking, the number one intention is to remind their own sinful soul first before they remind anyone else. And in fact, that every time that they use the word you, speaking to people in the second person, in reality, if their intention is true and they are wakeful, they will be speaking to themselves first before they speak to anyone else. Imagining that themselves are outside of their selves. In reality, you are you. Your nafs is you. But... Siyasat al-Nafus, governance of the soul, is the most important thing of all. The greatest thing that we can learn to govern is to govern our own soul and to put it into check and to be able to curb its desires, its appetites, and its passions, which is ultimately what gets us in trouble. And so, reading the Qur'an with the intention of amal, and here that you can use the translation of the meanings to help you do this. And I strongly encourage you, even if you don't le read Arabic, read a good translation of its meanings with this intention. How do I put that into practice? When does it relate to faith? When does it relate to action? When does it relate to a trait that I should have? When does it relate to something that I should do? When does it relate to something that I should avoid? And if we read the Quran in this way, this is opening up the door for our to put into practice what our Prophet is teaching us here in this blessed hadith. That the Quran is the makhraj. It is the way out. But if we're not reading it, if we're not pondering its meanings, if we're not reflecting upon how it relates to our day to day, how it relates to the circumstances of our particular time, then you will find that we fell short in our ability to truly live its meanings. And then look at what Allah, the, our Prophet says after this. فِيهِ نَبَأُ مَا قَبْلُكُمْ In the Qur'an you will find the nabat, which is news, of those who came before you. In other words, is that we are told a sacred history in the Qur'an of what you and I need to know about the various archetypes of people from the first man Adam and Prophet Ali until the time of our Prophet. And then we also know things are going to happen in the future by virtue of the Quran. But this is of the utmost importance. Allah gave us in the sacred history of the Quran everything that we need to know about the history of humankind in order to be able to do what we need to do in the moment. And every moment that passes, then ultimately take heed. From the lessons of those who come before us, we will become the lesson for the people in the future. We've mentioned this on multiple occasions, but this is a reminder to all of us. If we do not take heed from the lessons of the past, you and I will become lessons for the people of the future. 
And how many of us have heard pieces of advice from wise people who said, don't do that, or maybe you should do this, and then we failed to follow their advice, and then we're telling people after us the same thing, oh, I wish I would have listened to so-and-so. We are taught to seek advice and to that learn from people of experience. So in the Quran is the news of those who came before us, those people that were successful and those people that failed. And failure here ultimately is a relation to their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَخَبَرُ ma بَعْدُكُمْ It also tells us about what is to come. What is to come for the remaining days in this world. And we know, no matter how long time goes on, that it's going to be short. Time, the remaining part of the dunya, we are in not just the 11th hour, the latter part of the 11th hour. Our Prophet said, I and the hour are like these two fingers. And we know that all of the minor signs have appeared and they will continue to grow in intensity. All that remains is for the major signs to appear. However long that takes for them to manifest, we are at the tail end of human history. And we know this. This has been prophesied not just by our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, other religions and even other micro-religions and other... This is a universal for people believing in the end. Even cosmology, that even people who study cosmology are telling us this. When you study mega trends, everything is pointing to this. Whether they're speaking of in the context of that resources or global warming or in the context of nuclear war warfare or whatever, or the collapsing of the universe, everybody seems to believe in this, but we're just on that ship that is sinking and no one even is aware of what is transpiring. This is to wake us up. So the Quran tells us about what is going to come, but then what else? وَحُكْمُ مَا بَيْنَكُمْ It is the judgment between you. It gives us detailed guidance on what it is that we need to do. It gives us a hukum, a way to live, a way to be. We know how to interact with all different types of people by virtue of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in all different types of situations. وَهُوَ الْفَصَلْ That it is the final word. وَمَا هُوَ بِالْهَزَلْ That it is not something light. The Qur'an is very serious. Is that the Qur'an, you don't come to the Qur'an joking. You come to the Qur'an in read. And that anybody who comes to read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book will know is that the Qur'an speaks about ultimate reality, virtue on every single page. There's a reminder of the hereafter to wake up, to come to tune, in tune, and come to terms with true reality. And it's fasl. It is the final decisive word. And the Arab have this concept of fasl khitab. When multiple people mention their opinions, but one person's opinion is so well thought out, it's so grounded in knowledge, is that everybody realizes that that's the truth and that's the opinion we need to go with. The Quran is fasl. Is that it is the final word on any matter. If it's mentioned in Allah's book, and the meaning is definitive and not open to interpretation, that's it. This, that solves the matter, and then it's about bringing it into our lives. And then look what Allah Ta'ala then says, and look what our Prophet then says, مَنْ تَرَكَهُ Whoever abandons it, min jabbar, Anybody who's a tyrant, قَسَمَهُ Allah. Allah will literally break his back. So if you're in a position of responsibility, and there's rights, that you are supposed to be giving people, and you fail to do what the Quran is telling you. For example, and this might be someone not just who's in a state of that political leadership, but this could also be someone in relation to their own home, is that there will be people that will be raised with Pharaoh, and the only people they're responsible for are people in their own home. And when the Quran tells us about it, people are going to go their separate ways, what does he say? That imsak bin ma'roof, if you're going to remain together, treat each other well. Otasrih bi ihsan, or release with ihsan. This is what the Quran says. This could solve all marriages if this would simply be put into practice. Treat each other well, or go your separate ways with ihsan. And anyone who's done community work, ya Latif, will tell you 
how nasty a good portion of divorces get. And why? They fail to follow the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's clear-cut guidance on any matter. But if we're not reading it, if we're not taking it serious, then what's going to happen? Woman huda min Allah. Anyone who seeks guidance from other than the book of Allah, Allah will lead that person astray. But again, if you and I aren't in touch with its meanings, if we're not reading it, memorizing it, coming to understand its meanings, reflecting upon it, how are we going to be able to do this? Much of the problems in the Muslim world stems from the perspective that we have and it not being a Quranic perspective. We're not seeing the world through the lens of the Quran. The more we are steeped in this, and it is precisely no one changed history like our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, because of how he viewed the world essentially was purely and solely from a Quranic lens. And then the Prophet goes on, It is Allah's firm rope, الحكيم, and it is the wise reminder, and it is the straight path, and it is the Quran that remains straight even if people themselves go astray through their desires. And no matter what people say, ultimately truth can be clarified. What's in its book, The true scholars never become satiated from it. Sayyidina Uthman bin Asad said, were our hearts to become pure, we would never become satiated from the Quran. No matter how many times that you repeat it, you never exhaust its meanings. You never get tired of reciting it. What meaning time and time again, no matter how many khatams, you, you go back to it in new meanings, like the incessant waves of oceans. Is that its wonders never end. And then after quoting a verse in the Quran, the Prophet goes on, وَمَنْ قَالَ بِهِ صَدَقْ Whoever speaks the language of the Quran and quotes from it has told the truth. Whoever acts upon it will receive reward. And whoever judges according to it will be just. And whoever calls to it, calls to the straight path. What a blessing to have the book of Allah. And these are just some of its great virtues. But getting back to what our Prophet said in the beginning, the Quran is the way out. And when you and I read Allah's book, in any time, but especially in times like this where things get confusing, this is the way out. And when we steep ourselves in tadabbur, in reflecting deeply on Allah's book, reading it regularly, you will find what you need in Allah's book. They say the seeker is not a seeker until he finds everything that he is seeking in Allah Ta'ala's book, may Allah Ta'ala bless us to be from the true seekers. And may we put this hadith into practice in a way that is pleasing to us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may that we come to find the Quran as a makhraj, a way out from every difficulty and every calamity and all delusions and illusions, everything that is trying to lead us astray. Ya Arhamar Rahmeen. And to make our feet firm, feet firm upon the path. Ya Arhamar Rahmeen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Sayyidina qulu qulu hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wali jameen muslimin. Fa astaghfiru fi anna ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Ashraf al-Anbiya Ayyid al-Mursaleen, wa ala alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahideen, wa sahabati al-Akramin, wa tabi'in innahum bi ahsan ila yawm al-Deen, wa alayna ma'am wa fihim bi rahmatika, ya arhamma rahmeen, wa shalom an la ilaha illallah, wa shalom anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah amma ba'd, ya ibadullah, inni musikum wa nafsi iyaya, bi taqwa Allah. One final practical piece of advice. The greatest thing that anyone could possibly indicate to you to do is to learn the meanings of tawajjuh. That is to direct our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the cure of all cures and the elixir of all elixirs. And in it lies all good in this world and the hereafter. And this is the way for us to 
everything that it is that we know we need and that we that don't know how that we need to get it and everything is that we even don't need. This is the source of all good. To learn the meanings of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To learn the meanings of calling upon Allah. Repeating his name over and over again. Repeating, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realizing our absolute impoverishment before him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And asking him to help us. And to give us a way out. And to give us guidance. And to make things clear. And then for our family members, in our loved ones, in our friends, and our fellow community members, and the people of faith that we are living with in these lands, and then our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters all over the world, and especially those that are being afflicted with the greatest of calamities like our dear brothers and sisters in Palestine, that turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way of the prophets, and it is the way of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is something that we want to bring in our lives. And if we bring this into our life and we find ourselves calling upon him regularly, at least every day 40 times, preferably 100 to 200 to 300 times, where we sit alone and calling upon Allah, and the best time is before Salat al-Fajr, but any time works, turning to Allah, asking him to take care of our needs, is that you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the door for you to achieve everything that it is that you are seeking to assist you when you are in most need. And this is one of the greatest ways of all to help people wherever they might be on the face of this earth. But we have to bring this meaning into our life. Learning how to call upon Allah and to supplicate Him and to petition Him and to beseech Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be female elect of those that yulihun ala Allah. That constantly implore Him and that seek Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وكرم على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ورضي الله تعالى عن سادات الخلفاء الراشدين ابي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعلى جميع اهل بيت الرسول الله المطهرين من عجاز وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين يا ارحم الراحمين يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات يا أول الأولين ويا آخر الآخرين ويا ذا القوة المتين ويا رحم الساكين ويا أرحم الراحمين أنزل لنا من رحمة من عندك نسعد بها في الدنيا والآخرة يا عالم السر منا لا تهدك سترنا وعافنا وعفونا وكننا هذا كنيا يا الله يا غوثا يا رب يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين فرج على المسلمين فرج العاجل يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الراضي يذكركم وأشكروا على نعم يزدكم ونذكر الله أكبر